Imagine going on a holiday, saying goodbye to your loved ones, then you are taken hostage and held at gunpoint for nearly six years. What if you became convinced that you'd be executed by the world's most feared terrorist group and your hope of survival almost went to zero? Steve McGowan doesn't need to imagine this. It happened to him. He went to hell and back from 2011 to 2017. No contact with his wife or his parents for nearly six years. They thought he was dead. At times, so did he. Instead, he became the longest surviving Al-Qaeda hostage in history. Continue on with this video to hear Steve's incredible story as I interview him. I'm prepared to be deeply humbled and inspired as to what is possible. What I wanted to cover off today is um, really some of the things that you learned about yourself and some of the things that you might have learned about life during those, what is it, 68 months that you were in captivity. Um, you and I just had a conversation offline before we started here about your definition of failure. And I thought that was an awesome place to start. I hadn't planned to, but when you mentioned it two minutes ago, I thought that was great. So how did, how did you change your definition of failure uh, during your time um, in captivity? <clears throat> So, Brian, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've done quite a few talks for schools here in SA, and I'm not quite sure they always are very happy about my definition. But, um, you know, back at school days, you think if, if you didn't get the pass mark, well, then you failed. And it was as simple as that. You wouldn't progress to the next, to the next, um, to the next grade. But what, what I learned in the desert was actually, you know, to not, to not succeed was not the end of the world, actually. It was, it was learning along the way. Um, because there was a time I, I built myself a hat, and I was hit by a thunderstorm. And my flipping hat fell on my head and it was the most miserable experience, three hours in sopping rain and I was stuck under a bunch of branches and stuff. And, but I learned along the way. So the way I define failure now is, is actually not giving 100%, not giving yourself to a situation and actually applying yourself. Because, you know, if you don't get the marks, well, you still learn something along the way. And, but if you don't give yourself 100% to a situation, you, you not only are letting yourself down, you probably shouldn't be doing what you're doing anyway. You should be doing something else because if yeah. you're not going to apply yourself, you're letting yourself down. And you're also letting it down everybody around you as well, you know, I think. Mm. So, so failure is not about the grades. It's about not applying yourself. What, what, did, giving, what did giving 100% mean when you're um, stuck in the desert, you haven't spoken to your family, you don't know if you're ever going to speak to your family again? Like what, what, is, what is giving 100% to that situation and what did it become um, to mean to you? You know, I suppose in the desert, I mean, it was about survival, end of the day, you know, I had, I had very little at my disposal. Um, I had pretty much, pretty much nothing. I mean, I arrived, I arrived in the desert with a pair of shorts, a pair of jocks, a, a t-shirt, my wedding ring, um, one flip-flop, and, um, and it, oh, I think I said a t-shirt, and, and that's what I arrived, that's, that's literally what I had. And um, I literally had to reinvent the wheel, uh, you know, I, I had to learn how to build houses, build huts, um, and so, so my my objectives was just really to survive okay i wanted to come out physically intact i wanted to come out um, human i wouldn't want to come out angry so my objective was get out of this desert as a complete person and i mean so my objective was very simple and there was a, and, and i think the simplicity of an object of, of an objective or a vision is the beauty of it the minute it starts getting convoluted and complicated i think you start getting distracted and confused with the noise so yeah, I am. Um, yeah, sorry, man. You, you so, so you were saying. No, no, that, that's good. Hey, in, in the in that first, I mean, we don't even want to put a time cap on this, but I'm just imagining stupidly the first twelve months or so would have had the roller coaster of emotions, and I'm sure the entire five years and eight months had a roller coaster of emotions and thereafter. But particularly that first twelve months, I mean, what were your emotions doing when you started to? Um, face up to the severity of this situation you found yourself in. I mean, we we all know what we see from the press eh, about Al Qaeda, and I knew very little being being a South African because it doesn't really affect us down here. But I mean, Al Qaeda, everything you see was the twin towers falling down in New, in New York, you know, and guys getting beheaded and stuff. And and I had my British passport on me, and I was terrified. I mean, what can I say? I was absolutely terrified. It, I was probably numb for the first six months that that I was completely out of my depth. Nothing made sense. I was kidnapped with two other European guys, but I had the British passport. So I was certainly the, the first guy to get killed. You know, I, I, it, it, was, it was terrifying. And um, besides the uncertainty of what actually was gonna to happen to me, I had, I had a lot of responsibility back home. And I had these sort of 
if I can call them irrational thoughts, I mean, on the day of my kidnapping, I kept thinking, my wife has given me six months. I have to be home in six months. I mean, of all things to be going through my head at that stage, I kept thinking, six months, I have to be home in six months. And it's almost a bit of an irrational thought, but, but I was clutching at absolutely anything to, you know, to, to make sense and to, to try and get some kind of control over the situation. And, um, well, my, my, my parents were, were going to retire, and I had to, I had to go and take over, take over the farm, so I had guilt about that. Um, my, my wife and I were going home to have kids, and we were both in our 30s, and so I had guilt about that because this was sort of our window opportunity to, to actually move on with things. Um, but, you know, besides that, there was just, we, we don't realize what we are capable of as humans. You know, we, we, uh, when we were back in the cave with a club throwing rocks at each other, well, then we pretty much knew that you could get your, your, your leg chopped off and you could probably still limp on, you know, and off you go. But now you get a sniffle, you dash off to the doctor. So I had so many concerns, my health mm. concerns. I had concerns if I was going to die, if I'd be killed by, by the French when they arrived. Um, what, was I, what was I capable of? Um, mm. But so it took a long time for me to reset my mind to actually understand who I was and we, what humans can get through. Were you able to um use a comparison point with the other two guys that you were with as to how they were faring and how they were managing mentally and psychologically versus how you were going did did you start to use that as a benchmark of um how you were handling the situation um yeah but we all had very different personalities and we all had very different strategies to actually survive and i don't i can't say there's a strategy that you sort of walk in and go right i've got the answers because you certainly don't. Nobody sure. ever gave me kidnapping 101, you know, back at Varsity. So, so you walk in there and you blunder your way around. But the other guys had different, different, different um, strategies. But I knew what I wanted to achieve. And I thought I knew what was required to get me to that point. And the other guys had their other, other objectives. And I thought their, their, their strategies would not get me to where I need to be to come out. Yeah. So I would, we, we would sort of gauge up against each other. There was, there were, in a way, there was an unspoken competition as well between all of us because three different nationalities, three different countries, three different ages, we weren't mates. I want to go home first. I put my hand up. I want to be the guy who goes home first, you know, and if it's going to be any charity, because I don't believe there'll be a negotiation, if it's going to be any charity, let it be me. So, so, yeah. so I did gauge myself against those guys, but it was more like a life and death situation. Mm. To say, if I don't want to die, so I need to become, I don't want to be an, what's the word, uh, you know, on a graph, you don't want to be the guy on the side, you know, you want to be snack bang in the middle of normal, that you can actually sort of, that you don't get pointed out as being, let's do that guy. No. Um, a couple of things. I'll say three things for people that are listening right now. Uh, apologies if you only gave yourself seven minutes to watch this. Maybe just do it in segments of seven minutes because uh, it might have gone uh, a little bit towards that. Secondly, um, I want to just, again, the, on screen, I'm going to have Steve McGowan's link. It's an incredible story. I think the world needs to hear it more, Stephen. Um, I think your humility and, um, and your ability to tell it in, in, a, in a way of strength rather than a way of, of weakness, but still be vulnerable about it is something beautiful. And I think it's probably you being true to yourself. Um, and also go to 7minclub, 7minclub.com. You'll get some blogs and you'll get the rest of the videos that Stephen has done um, with us. Stephen, I'd love to have you back. Fantastic. Have a good evening. And you.